Thanks. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day three of uh, <clears throat> Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2014. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. So um, it gives me great pleasure to kick off today's lectures with uh, Catherine Borges. Now, Catherine is a member of the Southern California Genealogical Society, Daughters of the American Revolution, and the Colonial Dames of the 17th century. You'll have to explain what that's all about. Um, she is also director of ISOG and president of the Salida Chamber of Commerce. And uh, she comes to us all the way from Northern California. So it gives me great pleasure to open today's lectures with Catherine Borges. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. And thank you for that nice introduction, Morris. Um, I've been doing genetic genealogy. Well, uh, first, actually, I started with traditional genealogy about um, 14 years ago now. And then about three years after that, I attended a Daughters of the American Revolution lecture that was on using DNA for genealogy purposes. And to be honest with you, the subject matter went, as we say, over my head and under my feet. It completely bypassed me. But what I did learn from the, the speech was that the speaker had tried it and it, it had worked for her. So that made me very proactive in learning more about it. In fact, I constantly still do read and learn more about it. And there's always new things to learn because um, it's a very rapidly evolving field. But as you can see today, today's a basics talk. And so I will try to speak as basically as I can about uh, using DNA for gene genealogy testing. So there's the three most important things that you need to know are the types of DNA tests that are available because many people, if you're, especially if you're just starting out, they're under the impression that they only have one type of DNA in their body, but that's not true. You have multiple types of DNA that can be used for genealogy purposes. And the, these types of DNA follow different ancestral paths. So that's a very important thing to know too. Um, when I first started out, I called up Family Tree DNA and I wanted to know why I couldn't do a Y chromosome test. <laughs> because, um, and the poor vice president of the company, Max Blankfeld, was the, the poor person that answered the phone, and he had to explain to me that I didn't have a white chromosome, which I learned in biology in high school, but I didn't retain that part. And I'm going, but I look like my dad. So anyways, that's very important you know that. And then how it can work for you. So to begin, the four most popular kinds of DNA tests on the market are Y chromosome tests, which are also um, known as surname testing, because especially in places like uh, Western Europe, the Y chromosomes often handed down with the male surnames. There are some exceptions, though, as you know, with clans, which I'll talk a little bit about that later, and also um, populations that adopted patriarchal surname patterns much later, for instance, the Welsh and the Portuguese. The Portuguese did not adopt, which my surname is Portuguese, uh, did not adopt a patriarchal surname pattern until about 1900. So before that, they would take the mother's maiden name or they would take a name of their noble ancestors. They have very good records in Portugal, but with the non-patriarchal naming pattern, it's really difficult to do the genealogy sometimes. And then SNP testing, it stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. Some people say SMP. I say SNP. It's just easier for me, and that's the way I first learned to abbreviate it. And what that does, that confirms your ancestry on just one line, your mother's or your father's, and I'll talk more about that too. And then autosomal DNA testing, which is relatively new on the market, and that tests the DNA from both your parents. So where does the DNA come from? We often get questions, especially out of the stall, even as mainstream as DNA has become, is do I have to give blood? And fortunately, no, unless you scrape the inside of your mouth really hard, you're not going to produce any blood. So... It's just a swab of saliva, but um, the place where it came the first, and that's why the, the, the picture is up there, is it came from ancient remains. So a lot of the first testing that was done was done on ancient remains, and you may have heard of some of those cases like Cheddar Man, or most recently uh, King Richard the, uh, the III found under the car park in Leicester. Mm -hmm. So, um, but fortunately for us, because most of us are not on any kind of direct path from someone famous who has had their DNA tested, we just do it using a simple swab of saliva from inside the mouth. So for males, to begin with, I have a chart up here. This is the inheritance pattern for the Y chromosome. So it follows the male line just like the surname along the blue path on back farther. And then males also have 
DNA from their mother that's called mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA is, um, follows the female line. Males do not pass it on to their children, only females do. But you can test for your mother's line, which, um, again, I'll talk about later and how important it is. And then that's just for the Y DNA path, because I'm going to talk about Y DNA testing first. So this is, uh, we call this a, a Y chromosome tree, or Y, sometimes it's called the Y SNP tree. That's what we call it an ISOG. But as you can see, this is a, a screenshot from Family Tree DNA's um, page, and they have Adam up in quotes because they have been able to trace DNA back to one man and one woman. As far as the time frame goes, that constantly changes, um, and also some of it may be attributed to what's called a bottleneck, like a mass extinction. But as for what we have right now, though, they can trace it to one man and one woman, and then it, you can find the different branches on the tree where you descend from, and it, this is what it looks like in ISOG, as Morris announced. I'm the director of the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, and we maintain a tree, too. We have more uh, branches on our tree than a lot of the companies do. We update it further, but we also have a stringent criteria. There's also a couple of other trees out there on the internet, but um, this one is used a lot and has been cited by a lot of scientific papers. Um, so, to help give you reference for those of you that are Irish, um, these are the, the Y DNA from that tree haplogroups that are most common in Ireland. So, this gives origins, and as you can see, um, R1B is the most common one in Ireland. And that one is um, uh, the one that's in Nile of the Nine Hostages and a couple of the other groups that they study here. And, the, and these are the other ones that are most commonly found here. Um, this is uh, one of the ones that's R1B is called M222, and this is a screenshot from Family Tree DNA's MDM22 project, which um, if you test positive for that SNP, what's really great about this particular one is um, they are doing a lot of work on it. A lot of work has been coming out. We learned at the Family Tree DNA conference last week um, on research that's being due to refine down M222. Uh, right now, what this tells you, what it means if you come back M222, is that it means that you are Northwest Irish. And that's based on a study that was done in 2006 at Trinity University in Dublin. And um, we refer to it as the Nile, the Nine Hostages, where they studied Clan O'Neill and found that all these men shared a common Y chromosome signature, and it started with the M222. But as I said, it's also been refined down. Eventually, what we're hoping is that it'll be refined down so much you'll, you'll find a place and, uh, of origin. And you, this actually may be a result of something that you definitely have to go to Daniel Crouch's speech for people in the British Isles. Now, while you didn't test in Ireland, again, this is something that could refine down a place by the, this kind of work that they're doing. Um, and this is what it looks like on the Family Tree DNA site for if you test positive for M222. Um, this is a white, which when you test with Family Tree DNA, they're the only company right now that are doing Y chromosome, YSTR testing commercially. Ancestry was doing it, but they stopped doing it last month. Some of the other companies include Y, the Y chromosome the haplogroup, the, the deep ancestral origins in their test results, but they don't do the STR markers that you need for genealogy purposes. So this is a certificate of one of my friends that tested, and his ancestry traces to Ulster in the 1700s. And um, when you look at the certificate right now, uh, it doesn't, you don't derive much meaning from it because you have to take those STRs and be able to compare them to other men with the same results. So what, what Family Tree DNA has is a system called a, a DNA project. And volunteers like myself and Michael and uh, several other people in the room, Morris, we volunteer and run these projects. We don't get paid to do this. The reason we do this is because it helps us. It benefits us to be able to do these projects. So to be able to correlate the results. So for example, because my friend tested, and he has a um, paper trail line back to Robert Withrow of Ulster, he um, helped people that are brick walled in Virginia because they can match to him. So like if you have a gap in your paper trail, that's how that can help you. So you have to be able to correlate the results. Now, my friend is not M222, even though he has Irish origins. He actually has what's called Scott's modal haplotype. He's right there in the middle. And that was, I only had it back when he was 12 markers. I made him upgrade later. <laughs> so, 
Um, but he has the, the Scots modal haplotype, which is also another one that's very common in Ireland. Um, now, to go, to go over clans, my mother's maiden name is McCallum. And so one of the projects I set up was the McCallum, Clan McCallum, Malcolm DNA project. And my McCallum ancestor actually originated in Ireland, then went to Scotland, then America. And my line is daughtered out. If I'm going to get a McCallum uh, descendant, to test, I'm going to have to find one in Scotland, which there might still be one alive there, but there isn't any in North America. And then, um, or one of the things I have, because I think eventually technology will catch up to this, it's not quite there yet, is I have an envelope that's in a Ziploc baggie in a safe in my house. Nice dry place from 50 year old lick stamp of my grandfather. So someday I think there will be a company, that's what I'm hoping in my lifetime as technology advances, that I can get it out of the stamp if I'm not able to find a related McCallum mail. Now, what is fascinating to me about this McCallum project, and I have Scots and Irish McCallums in there, and Malcolms and McCollums, is that. Um, they, now, not everyone's <coughs> going to be related. That's something you always have to keep in mind if you have a clan name because people became part of clans for protectorates and took the clan name. However, to me, what's fascinating is that even through immigration or ones that didn't immigrate, the surnames often change to variants. Like up here in group four, we have a McCollum, a Malcolm, a McCollum, a McCallum, a McCollum, and then another McCollum. Um, they all share the same white chromosome. They have some changes in it. I mean, that shows that they're more distantly related, but they are all matching in that cluster. But even with the surname changes that they had, they still share the same white chromosome from their clan. So that's one of the fascinating things that you can find out about it um, in, the, in clan projects. Another project that I have, which I have been very fortunate to have two lions test while I'm here, is uh, lion, the Lion DNA Project. And I actually set this up for my husband um, back in 2004 because he has a lion's ancestor that's brickwalled in New York. And he has had a small success with it because the lion surname is common in Ireland, Scotland, England, France, and Germany. And the Spencer Wells is the head of the National Geographic Genographic Project. He was here yesterday and spoke, and if you didn't get to see it, you can watch the video on Morse's website. Um, he, there was a, a lion that tested through the Genographic Project. And when you test in the Genographic Project, you can upload your results into Family Tree DNA's database for free. So this lion did that. Now, his paper trail is not back as far as ours. Um, his stops in, in 1850 England. But what that did for us, even though our paper trail goes back to 1809, is that it narrowed the, down the countries in which to research. So I can, I can throw out all those other countries I just named besides uh, England. Now, much to my surprise, um, Brian Swan, who many of you know, and he's here at this conference, um, he had started doing some genealogy research for me, and he found that I had a lion line, <laughs> which I didn't know. And it happens to be this one. Um, the one that's related to the queen mum. And this particular lion line is very well documented. Um, this lion supposedly, I use the, you know, in quotes, came over with William the Conqueror. And he, d he did have um, descendants that went into Scotland, that stayed in England, and then went into Ireland. So we have DNA from all three of these lion groups. So the lions that have tested here have a very good chance of possibly matching this particular lion line even if they're brick walled. So that's one of the fascinating things it can do. And it's, it, it's a very well-documented genealogy. If you have lions in your ancestry or this line, you can find this in Google Books. <laughs> just do a search online. So one of the tests that I just realized, I forgot a name earlier when I was naming off the different types of tests, was mitochondrial DNA test. That's the one that follows the female line and uh, the maternal line. So males and females have it, but males do not pass it on. These are the ones that are common in Ireland, the different types of mitochondrial DNA here. And um, H is the most common in Ireland and in Western Europe period, probably most of Europe period. But um, these are ones that are considered indigenous to Ireland. Now, um, and this is my father's um, mitochondrial DNA certificate, which again, it's nice to have the certificate, but it doesn't derive meaning until you can compare the results. 
but there's a little story I want to share about this. This is my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother, my grand, this is my grandmother, my great grandmother, and great great grandmother, and they are Scots. They're from Aberdeen, and uh, my grandmother was an only child. And this is my father and me, and my father was an only child. Well, when I first got into DNA testing 10, 11 years ago, yeah, eleven, um, I went to my dad and I said, "Daddy, I need you to do a DNA test." And he kind of procrastinated at first, but then he did it, and about, I guess it was, what, six months later, he died of cancer. But I am so glad, this is the, the, the good moral of the story, I'm so glad I tested when I did, because Family Tree DNA stores the DNA for free for 25 years. Wow. And you, if you're the proxy for the kit, you can upgrade that kit at any later time, which I did for my father, because I did not, when I initially ran his results, I was going for the Y chromosome, as I told you in my earlier story, I was able to get his mitochondrial DNA and get my grandmother's DNA, and we do have matches in Scotland. Now, this particular chart is not my match chart. This is uh, from cousin Bill Hurst. See the Hurst surname right there? But Bill Hurst, it's a, it's a good example to use it, and those, Kelly is a quite nice Irish name to use for the example. Um, he had a theory that this Martha and Catherine Kelly were sisters, but they weren't sure if they were, so they, uh, he tested, and then he had another relative test, and they ended up matching, as you can see, on my numbers overlapped a little bit, so it corroborated that they were sisters and the daughter of Elizabeth Cummins. So it is possible to use mitochondrial DNA for genealogy purposes, it's just a bit more difficult because, you know, we often run into those brick walls in our records like, you know, um, my wife Mary, and no maiden name listed, that kind of thing, but it is possible. And it gives you oranges. Um, origins. <laughs> yeah, oranges. So <laughs> I'm thinking the Ireland flag. Okay, so my mitochondrial DNA though is Irish. And I my immigrant ancestor was um, named uh, was uh, arrived in a um, well, the story I've been told is that the in America they closed the ports to the famine ships after a while because there was so much immigration. So in our family, verbal lore, the ship was diverted to Canada because Canada, being a Commonwealth country, was not allowed to close the ports. So they came in through Canada into the United States and settled in Chicago. And that's the ship she arrived on in 1848. I don't have a picture of my immigrant ancestor, but this is her daughter. So um, Johanna Powell. And so when I did a DNA test, knowing that I'm Irish, and you know my parents had always told me, you know, you're Irish. You, that's why you like potatoes, you know. <laughs> but I tell you, I have no Irish luck to save my life. I always tell people if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And when I got my, my DNA results for this ancestral line from my Irish famine immigrant, I was quite surprised because, going back to that chart here, my mitochondrial haplogroup, the, what it shows for the origins, is not even listed here. I'm an N. And N is not indigenous to Ireland. It's all of my matches are in Eastern Europe, primarily in Italy. And so I had some people come up to me and go, yeah, you do look Italian. But um, so that left me with the question, if I'm, you know, I come from self-identified Irish famine immigrants. In the Chicago censuses, they're listed as Irish. All the documentation I have says they're Irish. They were Catholic. Um, but, you know, it, my DNA is not indigenous to Ireland, so am I Irish? Am I still as Irish as my parents said I am? And as far as I'm concerned, I am. Because the question is, when do you stop being one thing and become another? So as far as my ancestors were concerned, they were Irish. I have also my Scottish ones that I were showing you earlier. They, the McCallums, one of their lines were Huguenots from France in the 1500s and fled to Scotland. So when do they stop being French and become Scottish? So your, whatever your DNA tells you is just a piece of information and you can take with you and you decide how you interpret it, just like everything in your environment, just like how you were raised. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm still Irish, but being an N might explain why I don't have any luck. I didn't have it in the DNA. So, but I thought that was interesting. And one of the things, too, that you can do with family tree DNA is to be able to um, 
pinpoint and map where your ancestors were from, where they originated. And this one is the one for my um, Irish family ancestor. And all I have is, is that she's from Cork. Her surname, though, this could be a clue, too, that we might not have been as Irish as I th we thought we were. So her surname was English. Her name is Julia English. And as I probably don't have to tell you, English is not an Irish surname. So, <laughs> however, it's very common in Cork. There's a ton of Englishes in Cork. Um, Morris very kindly last year helped me go through the valuation records at the val Griffiths Valuation at the Valuation Office. And there's a ton of Englishes and Powells, which is my ancestors, in Ballylanders in Limerick. So I copied all those records, and I'm going to go through them eventually. I can have a success out of that. But uh, going on, so the, the fourth kind of DNA to talk about is autosomal DNA. And the autosomal DNA is the DNA that you get from both of your parents. And it, it mixes, so you and your siblings will not have the same amount within you. And um, some of the companies have very conservative thresholds for autosomal DNA. They'll say that it, it stops at about the fifth cousin range. However, you know, it's, it's random on how you inherit those patterns. I even know a person uh, that has inherited a, a whole entire chromosome strand just from one ancestor. So you, ne you never know. So what I recommend you do is I recommend you, you enter all of your ancestors in your tree as far back as you have, because you don't know where those matches are going to occur. You don't know how to, it, 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 you inherit it. So to give you an example picture-wise, although this isn't the updated system that Family Tree DNA has, but it's good for visual. This is my brother, and my brother's coming out as 100% European. Well, uh, this is me. So as you can see, I have what I refer to as a pizza slice of Jewish ancestry. And I don't have any known Jewish ancestry, but um, out of my half Scott quarter Irish, the other quarter is Bohemian from Austria, Czechoslovakia area. So I'm guessing that's probably where that originated. But see, I inherited a chunk that my brother didn't. So that's why it's important to also test your siblings and as much as your family members as you possibly can. Um, this is my son's. And my son has an additional pizza slice of Native American DNA, and that comes from my husband's side which um, both of my children, because I've done autosomal testing on them, they have different amounts of Native American DNA. My son actually has more, so he teases my daughter and says, neener, neener, neener. Because <laughs> it's a prestigious thing to have that there. I mean, people, Americans like it. Anyways, <clears throat> this is another um, uh, chart that you get when you do autosomal testing, the family finder test through family tree DNA. Now, remember that story when, in the beginning when I said I called up Family Tree DNA and said, why can't I test for my dad? Because, and they had to explain to me, I don't have a white chromosome, and I'm going, I look like my dad. I have a lot of affinity. I'm daddy's little girl. So um, when this test came out, as far as I was concerned, I thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. And the reason is, is because I can see my dad's DNA in me now. I don't have to sweet talk males all the time into uh, ponying up their white chromosomes for me <laughs> to test because these three people that are listed up here are my cousins, they're known cousins. The bottom one with the orange is the first cousin once removed, so he shares more DNA in common with me. He's where all the orange lines are on the chart. Um, I'm the dark blue, and then the other two are fourth cousins. So where you see an overlapping segment like this, I know I'm looking at Bolt DNA. Granted, it could be from the Bolt's wife, or you know, female line, but since I don't know the maiden name, I just say Bolt. It's just easier, but I know that we inherited it from that same line. The, there's a more kind of technical process you can do. This is what I'm explaining right here is a very rudimentary phasing, but you can phase it and actually tease out the different ancestral lines, and many people have started doing that now. The companies will eventually implement it. They haven't yet. One of the reasons is because of the cost. It'll cost them a lot in server space to be able to tease out and phase out the different lines. So and, uh, another thing that you get that's very important, especially, too, for those of you that might have adoptees in your family or are adopted, is this particular screen. This is my son's. Um, I'm very conscious about privacy, so I usually only use my own uh, slides with uh, my, our names and then I get permission from cousins to use theirs. But um, so this shows that myself, my husband, and my brother, 
The computer predicts how they're related. You can confirm it down there. I left it to say pending so you can see that you have to confirm the relationship. Shows how much DNA you have in common. And then over there, if you, if the other person has entered their surnames, and you also have two, the computer will automatically highlight what surnames you have in common. So of course, because this is my child, he has all of our ancestors in common, so they're all highlighted. But that's something that's very handy in being able to pitch, pick that out. I recently had, um, I was at the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree, and I met a woman there who turns out to be like my, I think she's my second cousin, second, maybe third, or second once removed, but she's adopted, and she matches me on the bolt line. And the reason she knows she matches me on the bolt line is because I've had so many bolts test. She was able to phase out the DNA and know she matches. So I, it was really neat meeting her because I'm the first blood relative she's ever met, besides her own son, but... No, that's different. So, On 23andMe, which you, if you test through 23andMe, they're only doing ancestry testing right now. Um, you can upload your results into Family Tree DNA too, but the reason I included this slide is because they have a, a breakdown of the different populations. And I, I chose one that didn't have Irish on it, I see, but they do have Irish on their, on their list. Um, some of the other ones aren't quite teased out, but... Again, go to Daniel Crouch's speech because when he talks about the people of the British Isles, once that data is published and added to the database, you're going to see a lot of those populations filled in like that. So that will be really amazing. I'm looking forward to that. My brother won't be quite the solid blue. Um, something else that you might see in the media that or have heard about is Neanderthal DNA tests. And both 23andMe and Genographic give results for Neanderthal DNA. Now, I'm a genealogist, so I'm not really, I mean, I kind of look at this as a novelty, you could say, um, kind of interesting, or, and I also think it's kind of funny. Um, so this particular person has 2.9% Neanderthal DNA, and the average European has 2.7. So, um, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to say it, but it's, if you're into the ancient DNA or you're, you're more into the novelty of it, then this is something that might appeal to you, and these tests do have it. What it means is it just means that you share certain genes in common with them. So that's what this particular one has. And uh, Genographic, furthermore, gives you Denisovan results, which I don't have any in me, so I didn't show that. Um, resources. So as Morris said when he introduced me, I'm the director of ISOG. ISOG is a free society. I know free sounds too good to be true, but let me explain what's behind that. A group of us got together and started ISOG, and we felt that if you have extra money you want to spend on a DNA test, not more dues and fees for societies. So all of us pay for it ourselves that run it. Like, I, I, I pay for the website. But um, we don't take any donations. You can join for free, but what we do offer mostly is on the Internet is resources. So this is one of our most popular mailing lists, DNA Newbie. Um, it has almost 3,000 members, probably over the 3,000 mark by now. Um, oh, and it has a listing for Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2013 <laughs> on this one. But um, you can join this Yahoo group and ask questions, and there's all kinds of knowledgeable people in there, including doctors and scientists, who will help answer your questions, and people that do this, like Debbie Kennett, who specialize in this, um, and they'll answer your questions for free. We also have the ISOG Facebook group which is um, at over 5,000 members now. It's a private group because we try to keep the spammers out, but you don't actually even have to be an ISOG member to join, but we also have a lot of postings. We, Joss, um, who's here at the conference, has been posting the conference to the Facebook group the whole time I'm doing the Twitter part of it. And then one of my favorite, favorite things we have in ISOG, which could potentially be a big help to you, especially if you're just starting out, is our wiki. Um, it's kind of like Wikipedia, but it's just on DNA. And uh, a lot of it is done by Debbie Kennett, who's here at the conference, and um, C.C. Moore, and a couple other people are contributors to it, but it has a lot of free resources. And one of the things I like about it, too, is it's less work for me, because I used to have to do a lot of the content on the site. I also have books that I'd recommend, and Emily Alessino, who's there in the back um, with the black vest on, she has her book, it's called Genetic Genealogy, The Basics and Beyond. 
So this is a very good starter book to start with. Debbie Kennett as well also has some of her books for sale. Hers, hers starts out with uh, kind of like Emily's with the basics, and then, but then she also has a social networking aspect on it with uh, Facebook. And then these two books are a little older, especially Seven Daughters at Eve by Brian Sykes. That one dates from the year 2000, so it's very... It's very, very basic, but the reason I recommend it, I have several reasons I recommend it. One, it's good for, um, again, with the basics, especially mitochondrial DNA. You can really get a good idea of uh, un grasping the mitochondrial DNA from the little stories he puts in there. Uh, but also, he has some funny stories in there that I like, you know, and I think he broke his leg and he um, DNA tested hamsters and <laughs> things like that. So it's an enjoyable read, and you probably can get it in a library because it's a bestseller. And then Megan Smolignac wrote a companion book for the Who Do You Think You Are show. This is the American one, and it's from the first season. So the, the center part of it has uh, the celebrities from the first season. And Mo, what's the um, percentage again of how many Americans have Irish ancestry? It was supposed to be twelve and a half percent, but I think that's an underestimate. I think it is, because every time Morris asks that question in America, everybody raises their hand. So there's probably some Irish in there too. But the the reason I recommend this book too is she does include DNA in it, and it's very it's a very good, especially especially if you're just starting out in genealogy period. So. Um, yeah, can I add one thing? Sure. Oh. You can get it online. It's downstairs at the Goon. I have four here. That's all I have, and one down at the Goon. Okay. So, otherwise, you can order them all online. Okay. Great. Thank you, Emily. So, is there any questions? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. I'll bring over the uh, microphone and turn itself on. Sorry. There we go. Thank you. That was a really helpful talk. Uh, I think I'm still a little bit confused about. One thing about the Y DNA testing, it, if I'm right, the haplogroups are defined by SNPs, but the tests seem to test STRs. So when you get your results from a test, how do how can they place you in a haplogroup defined okay. by SNPs? That's a good question. Um, and also, I did I didn't really cover it. Uh, here's a good screen to show. Um, <laughs> so what a haplogroup is is a, a haplogroup is a group of haplotypes. And the YSTRs are haplotypes. This is a haplotype. So by knowing what haplogroup, um, which, you see how this one's uh, in green and these others are in red? So the one in green has actually been confirmed. It's actually SNP tested, SNP tested on for the deep ancestral origins, the R1B. So that one's actually been confirmed. The haplogroup's confirmed. So when you have no confirmed <laughs> SNPs, then what they can do is they can look at the STRs and then predict what these will be. So these are, the ones in red are actually predicted. They're not confirmed. Um, if there's a serious question about it, on what you might be, uh, Family Tree DNA will do free SNP testing. They have a SNP assurance program. And so, for example, one of my Thompsons, a Thompson is another project that I have. Um, they, the, I have a group of Thompsons from Scotland who are mitochondria, I mean not mitochondria, Y chromosome C, which now that's not indigenous to Scotland, that's indigenous to Asia. So they did free SNP testing on them to confirm that they really were, and they were. But um, so that's that part of it. They do, once you do SNP testing, they have extended <coughs> SNP tests that you can do to refine it down further. Some of the SNP experts, like Michael in the back, probably could share more info on that. Okay, if I could just ask a follow-up, maybe I do fully understand now. So the patterns of the STRs uh, making up various haplotypes are known to correlate with the haplogroups defined by SNPs. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I got so it. <laughs> all of these, all of these haplotypes here correspond with this R1B1B2. Great question. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions? We have one here from Daniel. Uh, yeah, just to follow up. Is, is, is the, um, so the idea is that the STRs are a cheaper way of doing the same thing. That, that kind of, um, is, that, is that correct? Like, well, yes and no. I mean, most people don't start out testing a YSTR to find out what the haplogroup is. That usually comes second. 
uh, secondary, but most people, for gene genealogy purposes, you need to do the YSTRs because you need the matching. And the 37 markers is about a three to 400 year time frame. As you, as you know, with the, the SNPs, the haplogroups, so we're looking at thousands of years time frame. Right. So yeah. um, the people, when they first start out and they do, like Mr. Kennedy, when he does a Y chromosome test, he'll get his matches and he'll see he matches other Kennedys, but then when he sees his haplogroup, then he might become interested in that and do further SNP testing, especially if he's M222. People that are the Northwest Irish type, tend to really be, as Michael can probably uh, collaborate, tend to really be into testing further deep downstream to see exactly where they go. Right, yeah. Okay. Some people say the SNPs are the branches on the tree, yeah. and the uh, STRs are the leaves at the oh, end okay. of the branches. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Thanks, Gerard. Any other questions? We have a question here at the back. Just in relation to the family finder test that family tree DNA do, um, I uploaded my results to GEDmatch, and I had matches with people who I knew were distant cousins from being in contact with them and paper records, which hadn't shown up as a match with family tree, but did show up as a match when they were loaded on to GEDmatch. Why did that happen? Probably because the gen match has a lower threshold set. So uh, family tree DNA tends to have more conservative thresholds on their system, which you can lower the thresholds, but all the same, when they give you the instantaneous matching, you don't always see it. So uh, the companies like to be conservative about the, the matches because they don't want you to have false positives. But since gen match is an independent website, they're able to show you more. That's probably the best way I can explain it. I've, I've done similar things with cousins. I've tested cousins that are six cousins. I only have one that shows up in 23andMe, but the others don't show up. So that's something that GEDmatch can do for you when you upload to there. Does that help? Did that answer that? Okay. What about the future? What will happen with SNPs and STORs in the future? Because... Uh, Obviously, the SNPs are higher up on the branches. The STORs are down towards the leaves. Are the branches and the leaves approaching each other? Okay, here, based on doing this for 11 years, <laughs> here's my future predictions. My future predictions is that um, with sequencing like the big Y, we will still get more markers. Right now, uh, Family Tree DNA offers 111, but people will probably continue to keep asking, asking for more because that's how it's been in the past. Give us more, give us more, we need to refine this down. But eventually the YSTRs, the time frame, and the SNPs time frame are supposed to intersect to where you can pinpoint an exact place like, say, Dublin, Ireland. Gleason, Dublin, Ireland. <laughs> when will that happen? Oh, next five years, maybe? 10, 5, 10? I mean, we're, we're on the threshold, too, of having an affordable whole genome sequencing. For the last couple of years, they've said that they're waiting for the $1,000 genome, but when we were at Family Tree DNA, we, were, we heard a price that was much less than that, so it's coming. In fact, in that sample I mentioned to you earlier about my father after he passed away that's on file at Family Tree DNA, I do not upgrade it anymore, and the reason I don't is because I'm waiting for the whole genome test, because... Wow. Since he's an only child and I have no more sources of it, um, then that's all I have to be able to test. And once I get the whole genome, I won't need any more than that. So hopefully. Yes, Paul. Uh, yeah, a comment about uh, markers. I, I tested myself to 111 markers. But uh, recently I sent my data to YFO, and the report that came back is 440 markers. Uh, the problem is I have no one to compare those. <laughs> Is, yeah, maybe a century from now, uh, the other companies will expand to that range if needed. Yeah, I got 444. Yeah, no, yes, STR markers. Well, now, Paul's surname is Burns. And as you, you know, that's a very common surname here. So maybe if you had some other Burns that upgraded into Weifel, you'd have some matches. Well, I'm, I'm Northwest Irish, but I'm the only one in my 
category, I'm, I'm the only one in my category who's taken the big white test, which provides the, the, the data that I then sent to WIFO to uh, also analyze <laughs> so far. Yes, you asked me for genomes. I can make it's complete for genomes. I can compare for that. Like, so, so you can. Yeah, Aiden, uh, Aiden has done that too. Yeah. Aiden has. Oh, right, right, right. All the M two two experts are in the back of the room, as you can tell. Great. Any other questions? Fine. Well, listen, as it just remains for me to thank you, Catherine, for. a Fabulous presentation, very, very clearly put. I always enjoy your presentation Thank because you, you've Morris. been doing this for such a long time. You know exactly what you're talking about and you can make it very concise and clear for everybody. Thank so, you. thank you very much, Catherine Thanks, Borges. Morris. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank I'm going to just stop that.